Hello and welcome to Newspeak. I'm Peter Whittle. Uh, we're going to be looking at various news items from what is an increasingly Alice in Wonderland landscape, <laughs> landscape when it comes to the news these days. Um, particularly this week, we're going to be discussing Jeremy Clarkson, whether that's gone too far. Also the trans situation north of the border and is it coming south? And indeed, finally, horrific thought for many of us, but is the chance there that we might one day rejoin the EU? Anyway, to discuss this, I'm very pleased that, well, first of all, we have a special guest with us, a returning guest, actually, uh, John O'Sullivan, uh, who is director of the Danube Institute. Thank you. Uh, welcome, John. Uh, Rafe Hadelman, Ku, senior fellow of the NCF and also raw commentator on GB News particularly, and Dr. Philip Kisley, senior fellow of the NCF and uh, from Leeds University. Um, I want to start <coughs> with this Clarkson thing, which is rumbling on and on. Um, we all know, you know, that he made remarks in his son column about Meghan Markle. It seems that now he might be losing his contract with Amazon Prime. Mm. Uh, the Sun has taken down this column uh, from its website. But uh, also on top of that, I think it's had a remarkable number of complaints, 17,500 complaints. Mm. Um, I thought well, before we talk about it, you know, for everyone's benefit, I would just um, reread what he wrote. This was in his column <coughs> about Meghan Markle. Um, he said, he lies awake at night, quote, grinding my teeth and dreaming of the day when she, Meghan, is made to parade naked to the streets of every town in Britain while the crowds chant shame and throw lumps of excrement at her. Uh, this is now being called, you know, horrific and uh, appalling and whatever. But the effect on him uh, and his career seems to be quite serious. Um, John, is this a storm in a teacup? Uh, well, it's more than that. Of course, the fact is that the line you just quoted is something which a private eye discovered had been used by him in an earlier Sun column to which no one had objected. Mm. Because in that one, he had said, I don't know why people dislike Meghan Markle so much. The, uh, the, other, the opposite conclusion mm. to the one in this one, I think she's terrific. Now, obviously, if you don't know that what the joke refers to, a scene in um, the movies, well, I don't even know, I never saw any of them, so you'll have to tell me Game what of it was. Thrones, Game, Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones. Um, mm. uh, that this, I mean, that's a reference to a scene in that, in that um, television uh, epic, and uh, I think unless you know that, it is really low vulgar abuse. I mean, there's no doubt about it and unpleasant and unnecessary. Of course, I have fairly critical views of uh, uh, Meghan Markle myself, but I don't think I'd go uh, in for that kind of thing. And I think he was uh, wrong. But having said that, mm -hmm. a misfired joke, which is not understood by people because they don't know the context, um, is something, and which uh, obviously he'd used before without mm -hmm. offense, um, that's something which does not deserve anything other than a simple apology from him, which is accepted. But of course, he's now made three apologies. Mm -hmm. He hasn't; they mm -hmm. haven't been accepted. In fact, they've been used as the lever to get further apologies from him on everything I, he's ever written, I, and that's what's dangerous. I, I think I would disagree slightly, John. There actually about the apology. I don't think there should be an apology. I think there should be an explanation, but I don't think there should be an apology, because once you start apologising yeah. in uh, for you know to try and avoid being cancelled, you're absolutely and utterly going to be cancelled. Because why do you apologise? Are you apologising because you're genuinely sorry? Well, what would he be genuinely sorry about? It's a misunderstanding. Like you say, it was vulgar and it was low and all the rest of it. And and yes, it was it was. I, in, in my opinion, it was bad writing because the reference wasn't obvious. No, okay, right. <laughs> But he's not apologising because he's genuinely sorry. He's apologising to try and save his career. And once the crowd smell blood, then they'll just go for you. So I think, I think the apology is, is completely and utterly misguided. But it says an awful lot about the awful nature of cancel culture, that people will go for someone like Clarkson on ideological grounds 
and 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 the idea that they're they're shocked and outraged is just it's just nonsense. Yeah, I've I've lost what little respect I had for Clarkson, not because of yeah. this article column, which I, I agree was crass and silly and without yeah. making the reference mm. to Game of Thrones, but because of the apology. <coughs> We're at a stage now where apologies make no difference whatsoever mm. to the other side who want to cancel you. Uh, in a, they will just give it as evidence that they were right in the first place. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we've seen from the refusal of Harry and Meghan to accept this apology, mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing that's been achieved through it. Um, of course, you know, the wider thing, you know, if you picture the scene though that he described from Game of Thrones, it's actually part of Britain's long tra standing satirical tradition. You know, if you think of James Gilray, cartoons, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Jonathan Swift, they were immensely scatological. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you couldn't, it's, right. it's, it's a core part of British satirical comedy in that respect. But there's also the hypocrisy of all of this, because I thought, well, didn't we have Miriam Margulies saying Boris Johnson should die of COVID? Oh, yeah. You know, didn't we have, uh, uh, whatever, what's the woman named Brand? Br what Joe Brand has it in the face. When, it, when the left does this, there's some mysterious mm -hmm. silence and tumbleweed, but when mm -hmm. someone on the right, an ogre on the right, does this, the other thing I thought was, what a wonderful track record Harry and Meghan have for taking scalps. <laughs> and yeah, big yeah. beasts. <laughs> Piers Morgan lost <laughs> his job in Good Morning Britain for saying that the Oprah yeah. Winfrey interview, interview was full of lies, as we now know that it was. Uh, Sharon Osbourne lost her job in America for defending Piers Morgan. And now you've got, uh, uh, what's his name, Jeremy Clarkson falling to the same fate. I mean, these are big beasts all uh, hoisted on, on this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, uh, I can say that it, it, this is, uh, I think it's absolutely right, you shouldn't uh, apologize for a moment. Um, but, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, the comparison, I think what was even more shocking was that 70, what, what is it, how many MPs signed a letter about it or something, you know, coming to the defence of Harry mm -hmm. and Meghan, mm -hmm. how many of those MPs signed any letter, you know, uh, condemning grooming gangs, for example. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that, you know, it sounds like a weird kind of, you know, esoteric uh, comparison, but I think it's not. I in a way, you've got very privileged people mm. uh, um, being utterly defended by yeah. the uh, media establishment, actually. And there's yeah. another double standard here, too, as well, which is the fact that for some reason, if you say something against a man, it's acceptable. But if you yeah. say it against a woman, yeah. the exact same words and the exact same sentiment, suddenly it's misogynistic. It's yeah. as if there's an extra evil because it's directed towards a woman, at a woman. At the same time that we're told men and women are equal, yeah. and there should be no distinction between the sexes. You're, if, if I said to you, you're a stupid man, you wouldn't think anything of it. If I said you're a stupid woman, People say that all I, the time. I'm, mis I'm misogynistic. <coughs> no. And it's that element here which I think is yeah. also very nasty. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of the things being said. But I also think there's a real distinction to be made and observed, if possible, between um, saying, look, I shouldn't have written that. Yeah. It, it was a mistake. Um, and I, I would use the word in those circumstances, I apologize. Um, now, I agree. Now, what is totally different is a mob calling for your head mm. and you step up and you read, uh, you re recite a litany of complaints against yourself and beg forgiveness and pardon. That is ludicrous. Mm. It doesn't work mm. in the way they hope. As you said, it simply makes the crowd more hungry for blood. Mm. And I think we should actually stand very clearly against that. That's why, although I actually, as I th say, think he descended to low vulgar abuse. It just wasn't, shouldn't have, it shouldn't have been in a paper. But once the mob came for him, I think at that point I would say uh, he's got to be staying the job at all costs, mm. even mm. if the even if the paper doesn't really want him anymore. Mm. I think we have to actually make a s clear stand against that kind of thing. But there's one other thing as well, isn't there? It, it fuels the narrative. So Harry and Meghan come back, or the spokesman yeah. comes back then with misogyny and all of the, mm. the the buzzwords, and then it feeds on itself and feeds on itself and feeds on itself, and it does so in this word salad gobbledygook. Yeah. Um, so I think William and Kate. And, and the royal family generally, when they're at their best, have the, 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 the best policy, which is, you know, don't explain and, 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 and say nothing. But but probably, I mean, you've already discussed in previous programmes mm. uh, the case of the uh, lady uh, in waiting who yeah. was forced mm. to resign. That's why I say at their yeah. best, not at their worst. She was yeah. A lady Susan Hussey. Mm. Mm. That's mm. right. Mm. And I think that was a shameful thing yes. for everybody mm. to, in a yeah. sense, run away from her, leave her exposed. She loses her job. And this was the result of a calculated ploy, a setup designed mm. to make her say something which could be falsely represented as racism. Although, 
people say <laughs> to each to people of the same race and different race all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, nice to see you. Where, where, where are you from? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're normally listening to an accent. In this case, she was responding to a carefully constructed false persona of Africanness, which the person who's pretending to be African then takes in an as an insult the reasonable request, you know, well, uh, where are you from? Mm, yeah, uh, that's yeah. an interesting costume, or what, what does <coughs> that resolve? Anyway, yes. uh, uh, there is a kind of, um, well, this is all politics uh, rather than it is anything else. It's the game of identity yeah. politics, well, it's playing politics. But th there is, as you say, th th this uh, with Clarkson, it's kind of being used. One of the statements I think put out by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex was, um, we've got to generally stop hate. You, in that sense of chill, because you sort of think, we know what you think by hate, mm. actually. And basically, this is a, a crushing of or a constricting mm. further of free speech, is it not? Yeah, this is, in other words, it's we've got to silence people who we don't like. Okay, and hate is a synonym for not liking, or hate is a synonym, as far as they're concerned, for the right, or old school masculinity, poisonous masculinity, and all of those things that are in the culture. I mean, I, 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 frankly, I, <coughs> I haven't got much time for Clarkson. Um, he, he seems to be that kind of boorish sort of mm -hmm. presenter who the left would love to characterize the right as being. Mm. I mean, you almost think, oh, why did it have to be you? You mm. know, why, why you? You know, because you are crass mm. on so many different mm. occasions. But, so even, but even his supporters would be disappointed because he was one of those two characters yeah. you thought would never give in to the mob. Yeah. Mm. Because he doesn't need to give in. He's, he's independently wealthy as well. Yeah. But his whole character and demeanor is never to apologize for things. Yeah. And I write in this strangely, bizarrely, it's Piers Morgan who comes off better in this in that yeah. he left his job and has refused to back down on anything that he said. Mm. And this just looks trite. Now, but the other point we should make here is that from what we've, and having looked into this a lot deeper, Amazon were going to cancel Clarkson anyway because his audience is limited mm. to the UK. Yeah. He's not achieving big viewing figures in America mm. with his farm mm. program, yeah. his grand tour, the, the, the spin off of Top Gear is, has run its course essentially. Mm. So he was on the way out, and you know, Amazon basically have got a nice way of cancelling him. Uh, even though they would have done automatically, but mm. they get the kudos from the left yeah. for seeing being seen to be acting nobly on this. There is a, a broader issue here, Senna. I mean, it comes up time and again. However, I can't help feeling that it, it is actually coming to an ahead, ahead, and that is that this is sort of basically the killing of any kind of humour. You know, I, um, I think it was Madeleine Grant wrote about this today in the Telegraph that essentially any form of satire humour is basically now you know, absent from our national li mm. uh, life. And it's played a huge part in yeah. our national life, hasn't it? Oh, it has. I mean, you know, we are, that, that defines us. Our, it's, part of our, it's part of our robustness, isn't it? Our mm. ability to laugh at ourselves. Um, and now humour, we, you know, you're not allowed to laugh at A because you're going to offend A and B. If you laugh at B, you're, not, you're, you're going to offend A, B and C, and so on and so forth. So public life, has become the most dreary place imaginable, um, mm. and I'm thinking, you know, part of the part of the problem is it's what it's what John Cleese said: we shouldn't we shouldn't gauge everything and fit everything to the most insecure people in in society mm. Mm. because everything else becomes just so awful, and mm. I think that's. Well, it's not where we're going, it's where we are, isn't it? And we shouldn't allow neurotic people who hate to be offended or challenged by something new mm. to do, do university courses which are supposed to provide them with that kind of stimulus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, we're very near the situation, the Soviet Union. Um, my last, the last a few days ago, I heard an anti-communist joke from those days, and that was a judge is coming out of the court and he's laughing and a friend says, well, what's so funny, he said, I can't tell you. It's a great joke, but I just gave a man ten years for reporting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually, apart from that, we, we've just laughed, uh, laughed at that. Where do you actually look for humour now? If you, where do you? What makes you laugh? I mean, not generally, but like now in 2023, where would you look to go to, to laugh? Well, I listen to Radio 4 Extra, which is where I can listen to Hancock's Half Hour right. and uh, yeah. The Goon Show and everything yeah. else. So it's the last bit of the BBC. Unfortunately, it's going to be cut under the new uh, cost-cutting measures. But it's the BBC's archive, for all of its current ills, its yeah. comedic archive is, is second to none. Yeah. 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 But that's not now, though, is it? It's the archive. Yeah. I'm just trying to think, yes. where, would you, where would you go now? I mean, there are some great stand-ups, like Simon Evans, who's a, who's yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. a, a friend of, of, of yeah. this channel. But no, I... I, I 
I don't go anywhere for, for, for modern comedy just because it's not funny. And my God, situation comedy died kind of in the 80s, really, didn't it? Um, I, I look at, actually, I look at the other side and, and, I, and I laugh bitterly you know, at yeah. what's going on in politics and what's going on in culture. And I'm not part of it and laughing with it. I'm on the outside looking in and mm. laughing at it. And it's actually quite tragic, but then again, tragedy and humour are both sides of the there same coin, aren't they? A couple of very decent American stand-ups, and you can go to America because of the yeah. First Amendment, they still feel more at liberty to say things yeah. which are unsayable here. Mm. Um, and also we've got, I suppose, Ricky Gervais on that front. But yeah. what's interesting is that the people that people on the right or free speechers like to raise up are interesting. If you've got Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr or Ricky Gervais, they will attack women, they'll attack vegans, they'll attack trans people, but, they but they'll never go on to the race issue. Yeah, yeah. So all, and they're, yet they're touted as being the people who will say anything, but there are still taboos which even they, these alleged free speech champions won't go or near, or BLM for example, or any of this sort of thing. Or Islam of course. Or, and Islam, 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 Islam and race yeah. are the two yeah. things they won't touch. John, I mean, do you, do you think that there's anything in the view that, say, like sitcoms, which were a big part of British uh, culture, yeah. I mean, uh, you could say it was actually working class humour. I mean, mm. you know, actually there were two, it was a working class show like Are You Being Served? And then there was The Good Life, solidly middle class in a way. But the thing is, what they both had is they appealed to a large group of people. I, we had common values. Mm. Is that why it no longer works, do you think? Yeah, well, probably the, the show I would cite uh, most is only fools and horses yeah, yeah. because that did have huge cross-cultural appeal uh, although it was about a slightly dodgy uh, group of mm. people in, who mm. were working class or uh, striving to get out of it by uh, un unreasonable means um, so I was uh, I, I would say yes um, this was very important on the other hand it hasn't altogether gone I'm not, I don't I'm not as gloomy as you all seem to be. I mean, only Fools and Horses is actually no musical, as you know, uh, here in the West End. I think the only, just to, sorry yeah. to interrupt, John, but the yeah, only Fools ahead. and Horses example is a really good example because what's that about? It's about resilience and yeah. getting ahead and, mm. and no matter what, smiling in the face of adversity. And if you think about what was really appealing about Only Fools and Horses and you think about British culture now, you know the victimhood culture it really demonstrates the the upending of of what, what i suppose in in the in the broader dominant culture what it means to be british now doesn't it mm. i think it's a really good example yes i think also you know you did a piece a lot while ago uh, carry on films didn't you it does mm. seem to be i'm sorry to go on about the class thing and, and i hope we're not being too gloomy here John, but i mean it does seem to me that that was essentially working class humor um, and although there were some, like Morecambe and Wise could go any either way, two on is certainly either way, um, that is the bit that's disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sort of like naughty but nice bit. Mm -hmm. It's not just the class thing, maybe it's feminism that's done that, I don't know. But that kind of uh, end of the peer humour. Mm. That seems to have gone. End of the, but not necessarily not working class. If you think of the royal family, which I thought was brilliant, or, yeah. 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 or Shameless on Channel 4, there have been quite a few of these things which I deliberately uh, brought. I think it's, it's almost similar in a way to what happened to popular music. Mm. Up until Frank Sinatra in the early 50s, young kids said, we want our own music, and rock and roll came, which was something just for young people. Yes, yes. And if you look at it, it was actually, you mentioned, you mentioned The Good Life, 1982, when the young ones came out, and the opening scene was them charging through the opening title sequence of The Good Life, <laughs> saying, this is punk as attacked comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's from the alternative comedy scene that the rot set in. Mm -hmm. Alexi Sale started all of this when he had his comedy club, mm -hmm. and you had Ruby Wax and um, Ben, was it Ben? Ben Elton. Ben Elton, Elton. Yes. And all these characters going in, and then and Marxism came into the comedy as well through through Alexis Sale and that was the death of family comedy that was the end of this of the Jimmy Tarbucks all of whom were conservative right if you think about yeah, all yeah, the yeah, they, they were all conservative Bruce Forsyth, yeah. the, the BBC was conservative the BBC was yeah. conservative Bill Cotton the head of light programming mm. at BBC very conservative Morecambe and Wise the two Ronnies these were all you know golf clubbing Tory yeah. supporting Thatcherites can I, can I make just one more point on this? Yeah. And I think it's an important one. There's something else about the generations as well and the, and the connection between the generations. Let's just go back to Only Fools and Horses again. There's almost three generations there. I know they're yeah. brothers, but there's, there's an age gap. And then there's granddad or Uncle Albert. If you think about Steptoe and Son, there's this connection mm, between mm, father and son. Mm. If you think about other shows like Minder, for example, again, it's mm. this, it's this, it's this, 
discussion between the different generations mm. and I think that's gone somehow mm. you know a, a, a post alternative comedy middle-aged people who are, who are our age and older now the, they they try to act as though they're 20 you know mm. badly and that yeah. that differentiation of generations somehow has gone and I think it's really sad mm. that that's happened actually mm. it's sad for the for the richness of our culture mm. and, and but but that's something that I really love about some of those older shows it'd be interesting actually for for viewers to uh, speak yeah, in the comments, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it, yeah, about, yeah. about what they love about some of uh, British comedy and British drama as well. Yes. Yeah, and th I think there are other shows, comedy shows, which uh, don't quite fit into your analysis, but don't contradict it either, but just show that there was much more variety, yeah. and some of mm. which was class cl classist. I would say the humour um, of one-upmanship mm. um, was really quite an important strand in the 50s and mm. early 60s. Um, and and um, shows like, uh, which not exactly a comedy show, but My Word, mm -hmm. those liter yeah. literary kind of game shows, mm. they mm. were very important. And although they probably did appeal mainly to, say, middle class um, uh, listeners, they they weren't so they were not solely middle class. Just as the shows you're talking mm. about, um, they may have had a mainly working class theme or audience, but uh, some of them at least. Mm. But they they had middle class uh, addicts. Mm. Mm. Um, yes. I mean, my mother was absolutely mad about, um, uh, and so was my sister. Um, when I'd go home to see them, um, and I'd be made to watch Only Fools and Horses, mm -hmm. which I sort mm -hmm. of didn't know much about. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the, this variety, which meant everybody got mm -hmm. uh, something they really liked, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well as watching things that they sort of liked, mm -hmm. which other people liked. That was very important, and, and that goes when ideology comes yeah, in. Yeah, a lot of these things relate in various yeah. ways to, to British identity and British values mm. and, and British culture. And familiarity. And familiarity you, you as know, well. You feel and, familiar. Yeah. And, and the new stuff or, or the stuff post alternative comedy is is ideological and, and you see you see kind of nascent identity politics in it and it and it's homogenous. You know, this yeah. is what you have to think because it's ethical to think this yeah. and we and it's ethical comedy. You know, there's an oxymoron if ever you heard one. It's certainly not funny, is it yeah. either? Um, moving, moving on, we, I mentioned there is, in, is the second item uh, about the trans issue, in particularly, uh, I don't want to presuppose you know you know, know everything about it, but there's been this change in the law in Scotland now where um, it's proposed that people can self-identify, isn't it, um, uh, and, and basically uh, at the age of 16, mm -hmm. and it's been blocked by Rishi Sunak. Um, I just want your views on this because there was a, a very disturbing uh, story which actually Philip, you, know, you actually alerted me to. Um, there's a um, member of the Scottish Parliament who supports this new uh, proposal and it's coming out now saying actually you can change biological sex and it brought to mind something that we were talking about a bit earlier actually John when you were sort of saying this uh, talking about the anti-science, anti-realism thrust of um, our public life. This is a, a woman, her name is Ma Maggie Chapman, and she's basically saying that children as young as eight are aware of being in the wrong body and therefore should be allowed to transition. I mean, to me, this is, well, it's, first of all, it's beyond humour, it's beyond satire, actually. But we're talking about our legislators, aren't mm. we? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is very serious. I mean, uh, to take a, a, an example which is even more rarefied and more disturbing, and that is recently the Harvard Faculty of Medicine announced that we're doing a course on how to recognize, to, um, that on how children as early as, you know, three, four, and five can sense if they're in the wrong body and, mm -hmm. and, and can sense what their real. Uh, I, what their gender identity is. Mm. Well, this is all fantasy. Yeah, yeah. And and it's um, I if it were left, I mean, I think we probably would say if people want to act in certain ways, in fact, act as stereotypes of women or particularly masculine men, um, and they don't take it to 
uh, the extreme of uh, being forcefully affectionate to other people who are not interested in that, mm. then um, we might let's say, okay, let them let people dress, let people act, let people. Let, there's there's no desire to make people conform to stereotypes yeah. uh, in this way. So, uh, what's objectionable uh, is when you s when you start to treat the fantasy as a reality mm. which has to be enforced on other people mm. and you mm. can't do that it seems to me a and secondly you can't therefore allow young adolescents who may be suffering from all kinds of s the psychological disturbances of adolescence or of medical illnesses of autism and others you can't let them decide that they are going and, or you can't encourage them or you can't um, to, to do to to have an expensive operation which may ruin their life mm. which they cannot possibly understand mm. do you think actually before we can I mean, what is your do, do you go along at all with the idea of being born in the wrong body or do you think this is just simply wrong because people you know now accept that this is a reasonable position I, you can be born in the wrong body I, it seems to me that you can't be you can be you can have a mental condition mm. right would you say I, th I think if you if you go along with the, the that premise that you can be born in the wrong body then it's actually a religious position isn't it because you're believing in a gendered soul um mm. and and yes well it, well it kind of is and mm. and and mm. you know i don't believe in a gendered soul it's as simple as that and i don't think that you can impose that set of beliefs on eight-year-old children. No. And you certainly can't have people who don't believe in souls believing in a gendered soul, so, yes, which is yeah. what they are doing. Um, what, what do you say is behind, say for example, the, uh, you know, Sturgeon's proposals about this? Do you think it's just a simple, surely you don't, you know, it's simple kindness or what? Well I think there are a couple of things going on here. Of course first we have the Green Party also in, in close um, collaboration with the with the SNP who are also driving this particularly yeah. um, but what was audacious I mean I, I was more interested in this actually from the political constitutional side of why they're yeah. actually doing yes. this because of the mischief making we've seen Rishi Sunak being a very different Prime Minister to either Truss or to Boris Johnson but not being combative extending an olive branch talking mm -hmm. about working together mm -hmm. and that doesn't go down very well with the SNP mm -hmm. because they want to have yeah. this yeah. Uh, th this enemy that this nemesis yeah. that they can work against and they found here in this legislation which they knew would fall foul of the Equalities Act mm -hmm. they knew that it would force the government into invoking section 35 yeah. of the Scotland Act yeah. and they've got a pre-ordained they've got an artificially created yeah. conflict here mm -hmm. and the audacity of Sturgeon to say that the Tories are stoking a culture war over trans issues because that's exactly what the SNP are trying to do on this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 oh, the totally Tory party, transparent. the government's been so timid about this and, and apologetic about having to do this. They don't want this battle to take place. And there's also the audacity of Nicola Sturgeon trying to say that this is an anti-democratic move by the by, by Westminster, yeah. given that the SNP she parliament is the most authoritarian well, the figure SNP in the whole. It reminds me of the, of the Brexit parliament we had in 2016-17, mm. because the SNP parliament has completely the opposite view to the Scottish population. Yeah. Two thirds of Scottish people think that this is the wrong bill. They are opposed to the lowering of the age, mm. and they are opposed to the ending of having doctors require yeah. gender dysphoria notice. Mm. Whereas it's two thirds. Of the, yeah. of the of the parliament that's in favour of it in yeah. Scotland, I and mean, there's this complete switch around. And I think this is obviously this is mu much more about mischief making than anything else. Yeah, but it, uh, this right. is about single issue stuff as well, isn't it? I mean, independence. Lots of Scottish people, for various reasons, romantic reasons, if nothing else, will buy into the independence thing. But once they buy into the independence thing, they find then that inadvertently they're buying into yeah. all of these culture wars things, which is, you know, for anybody who knows Scotland is anathema. Yes. yes. And by the way, the division you just described, Rafe, uh, this is the division across the Western world, or at least across the English speaking yeah. countries, yeah. in which you have two thirds of the elite believing these kind of things. Yeah. Exactly yeah. why they do is interesting, mm. but we don't, mm. we, we're not got to the bottom of that yet. And the uh, rest of the people thinking, this is complete lunacy. Yes, but the yeah. thing, you know, you were talking about reality and, and fantasy. It maps on to the other key narratives as well, doesn't it? Particularly. Yeah. Can I just tell a quick story about masks? I went for a hearing test um, last week um, and I went into this little room with the, what do you call them, the audiologist and mm. she had a mask on 
uh, and I sat down and she's obviously used to speaking to people who are either profoundly deaf or partially deaf and I'm not joking right this is what happened I'm not joking she had this mask on she pulled it down right looked right into my face and said I'm going to show you a chart right <laughs> and then pulled it up again and then showed me this chart and I was left there marveling yeah. at this yeah you know disparity between reality and fiction and and the mask is a symbol of, of mm, all of those things yes, isn't yes, it yeah. you know um and and she was performing virtue mm. she was performing you know goodness mm. but she was okay with me seeing literally the mask slip it was yeah. a completely bizarre thing but it's that reality and fantasy yeah. mm. you know Do well you of course the, what we're talking about as in, in medical terms is uh, um, a, surg a surgical attempt uh, to correct a psychological disorder yeah. and it obviously cannot work mm. um, it will simply produce different kinds of problems mm. in the person's life and Douglas Murray makes the point when he talks to university audiences he discovers that um, people who have taken this position very often think it's going to solve all of the problems in their lives. They'll become a different person and they won't have the normal things that cluster around them and annoy them all the time. Mm -hmm. I want to actually um, just get up for you just um, here. Yes, what, what she said, this is Maggie Chapman, the Green Party uh, uh, MEP, uh, MP. Um, she, Scotland should explore allowing eight-year-olds to declare their own legal uh, gender um, but she was sh she went on it was it was something about that's right yes um, people cannot know we cannot know actually that there is real biological sex uh, simply because well we haven't we haven't checked everybody mm. I mean it's <laughs> sorry that sounds good it's um we haven't been to every human being so how do we know some of them might change biological sex is basically what she's saying mm. I mean this is beyond crazy isn't it well, the thing that's very, yeah. very eccentric. I mean, yeah. the, the, the thing that really compounds it, I think, I think it's in that article as well, if I understand it correctly, she's saying that primary school children should get the vote. Right, okay. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I mean, I mean, I'd like to actually increase the the vote to twenty one person. At least. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At least. Can I ask just one thing? Oh, going on from this, really. Um, it, this is a very big subject, but this. The way in which Scottish culture generally seems to have hugely changed. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe what I have was a kind of stereotypical view, but it was kind of hard, uh, hardy, uh, no nonsense, uh, hugely exploratory as well, very outward looking. Mm. And it seems to have become c completely Scandinavian, uh, you know, kind of liberal yeah. Scandinavian. Well, what's happened to Scotland? Because so much of what we discuss on this on this show mm. uh, happens in spades doesn't it in mm. Scotland uh, what, what, yeah. I, mean, do you, what well, I think the first step which the other things then went on to the first step was to conceive of Scottish culture in politics as a higher a better a more idealistic a more decent mm. co culture to that of England which was a Tory or mm. at least more Tory than not and secondly was uh, money grubbing um, uh, materialistic mm -hmm. and so on and so forth and the and the kind of common ground that both countries had which was the admiration for productivity mm -hmm. for effort for physical uh, labor as well as mental labor and, and achievement of that kind that was very much a part of the mm. Scottish identity prior to the Second World War mm. and that has and I think the desire to show we're above the kind of world which is represented by English cost calculation um, mm. and this is actually a very very European right-wing uh, view of things so mm. I'm, I'm being polite when I say right-wing there Mm. And it is also that being a small country, there's this idea that small countries are naturally progressive. And you know, if you look, just look at Iceland yeah. or mm. any of these places, but it's also the decline of religion, right? Mm. Because mm. Yeah. You know, Scotland was the land of you know of, of Max Weber. The Protestant mm. work ethic yeah, was really yeah. large there more than anywhere else. Yeah. Calvinist, Presbyterian, this whole idea of putting mm. uh, responsibilities first and foremost, and getting yeah. on with, with your yeah. life, not relying on others. This yeah. was all a real strong part of, of the culture. And with that departure, secondly, it's 
the fact that they have substandard politicians mm. because historically mm. the, the cream de, the creme de la creme mm. came yeah. down to Westminster. Mm. Yeah. So you had all the now there was much more visible under Labour, for example, but you had yeah. many great uh, heavy hitters under the Labour Party, mm. whereas you had just the, the has beens, the, the, the close run seconds running mm. things in Scotland. Mm. I think, yeah, uh, just to add to that, I think I think both of those are excellent points, but there's something that's also really sad as well historically because Scotland was of course the home of the Scottish Enlightenment mm. and, and all of this is, is completely anti-Enlightenment. Anti, anti totally yeah. anti, so, anti yeah. Uh, yeah. And they are, it's almost like they're they're turning in on themselves, they're eating mm. themselves up and it's and it's very sad. Yeah. Well it's a point I've often made, I've, I've said it up here before, you know, when did the Greeks stop being Greek? When did the Scots be, stop being yeah. Scots? So yeah. now I increasingly say, when did the British stop being yeah. British? Yeah. You know, we were once great, you know, enlightened mm. places. Mm. And what, what happened to put yeah. us into this current position? Mm. Well, I think that leads us on quite well to, uh, to finally what we're going to discuss, and that is the possibilities of us rejoining the EU. Now, I, I don't say that, <laughs> as a, and let's see how we can rejoin the EU. I don't mean that exactly, but it is sort of being whispered. There are little currents here and mm. there that, you know, it's almost like little footsteps. Um, basically, that we are going to at some point or other go back into the EU. And I'm thinking particularly of an article by Sherelle Jacobs mm. in the Telegraph, where she talks about the same, but basically it was much more f a possibility than maybe we like to think. Mm. I mean, John, do you take it seriously? Um, well, I like Miss Jacobs' writings in general, yeah. as a matter of fact, and I think uh, she's one of uh, three or four good uh, columnists in the Daily Telegraph. Several of them are women. I think she is uh, mistaken here. Mm. Um, I think she is mistaken because she is undoubtedly seeing a, s a, a genuine trend in the sense that the Labour Party didn't want to leave, finds that it will lose too many uh, uh, former Labour voters um, uh, unless it makes plain it will not rejoin. Um, and at the same time, you can see the suggestions that, well, we may not rejoin, but we, we might do is just gradually align ourselves more and more. And eventually one day it will seem like just we'll, it, uh, the final step will be just to go back in. That can't happen, I think, for two reasons. The main reason is that the, uh, the Europeans are very clear that anyone who comes into the and or, the, or rejoins uh, the EU will have to accept the euro, and that is a sticking point which I think the Brits have made clear over a period of time they will not do. The second is we are making other arrangements around the world with a whole series of countries. Uh, now those particular trade deals, they're not always very uh, big, but they're there. The second, however, the, but the, what is big is the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, mm. which we are candidates for, it we're not in, uh, but at the same time the opinion within the bloc is moving to get us in. The Japanese are now very much in favour and, um, and also the Americans and the Chinese, the Chinese might, if they were to get in, but they're likely to get in after the British, mm. be a problem. Uh, the Americans would want us in, I think. Uh, so. I think we will find ourselves making alliances um, which are going to be more important in keeping us from going back into Europe than, than the idea that we will have uh, de-aligned mm. from all of the regulations. That we will de-align, but not as much as I'd once hoped, but that's secondary now. Yes. I mean, I think I'm appalled by the prospect just almost sort of symbolically mm. and emblematically I'm, and to the point where I think I, I can't help feeling that if that actually ever came to pass that I'd be thinking well that's it the game's up the yeah. game's up you know if we couldn't sustain that you know I remember when we ha when, when we had the vote um, New York Times headline on the front page you know Britain leaves the EU mm. and I remember thinking this is of such mo you know moment this and extraordinarily sort of courageous thing for for us to do mm. supposedly a diminished country and I sort of thought well you know that means that we've still got what we had in the Battle of Britain and all of this I make no apologies for this mm. you know. um, and then to actually then just crawl back after mm. a few years I, it would be so shameful C can I ask you a question yeah. because you I mean you were absolutely at the heart of that weren't you yes you know? yes and after the initial euphoria that I think we all felt, mm. was was there a particular moment when you thought, "My God, this is 
this is not working out the way I want it to because no, people no, are blocking no, it so much. No, it was a gradual, shocking sort of realization over about two or three years. What, uh, 2016 to 19? Yeah. Right? During the Theresa May government and all of that, um, that maybe the government, the British institutions weren't what they thought, what I thought they were. Yeah. It was that absolute attempt to thwart the vote, whether through Parliament or through the media, and then you sort of think, really, this country that I really thought was this is not actually yeah. this. Um, I've lost that again a bit now, but that's yeah, that's when it right. wasn't. You know, you didn't really think it was seriously that we could actually come out, but it was just the reaction of people who were so angry yeah. that they had been gainsaid. Mm. Well, I think there's more than that. I mean, I think what you were reacting to also is the fact that a considerable portion of the British people and a larger proportion of the British political class had actually already emotionally transferred their loyalties, their sense of nationhood and patriotism from this country mm -hmm. to the EU. Yeah. And they were perfectly happy for Britain to continue or would have been um, as a, a regional, an mm. important region in the EU. And they would say, it's very simple, John, yes, we will have suffer some diminution of sovereignties and our, our freedoms, but we'll gr gain greater influence in the world. Mm. Well, who gains greater influence in the world as a result of Britain being in Europe? It isn't the voter, mm. he yeah. get, gets less. Mm. Uh, it, it is the uh, politi political class, mm. the official mm. class. And so this is a class issue, and it's a democracy mm. issue, and it's a loyalties issue. And um, all of these things added together are big emotional, pre are a big emotional issue. And uh, that's why you feel as you do. And mm. that's why we all fear a little. Mm. And on the other hand, I actually think it's not going to happen. So mm. I think probably uh, we will stagger through this as, other, as we have other crises and come out better for it. You know, it. you said, well, I, I was going to say, Ralph, you said uh, you often wonder, have the British, no, when did the British stop being British? Mm. I mean, would going back in be that moment? Well, I mean, I, I agree with, with John that at least in the medium term, we won't see Britain formally go back into the European mm -hmm. Union. But I think it's all but inevitable that there'll be an informal going back in, back along, alongside the EU. And we're already seeing that with Rishi Sunak being far more interested, you can see, on a closer alignment with the EU than either Truss or Johnson wanted to have. But the real reality here, of course, is that Brexit was always a conservative project, really, mm. uh, over the last few years, right? It's been the conservative mm. government that's been behind it. The Labour Party are not going to be anywhere near as uh, strong on Brexit as, they, as, we, as we hopefully were hoping this government would be. Mm. And once we see the all but inevitable loss of the Tory party in the yeah. next general election, Labour is not going to go for the Singapore on, 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 the, on the channel. Um, and you're going to, I think, see much more of a move by the Labour Party to adopt some sort of Swiss-style association. So you can keep your currency, but have some limited access to the single market, uh, but also accept the European Court of, Court of Justice, because the European Court of Justice is a, is a red line for the ERG, for the, for the right of the, of the Tory party, but it's nowhere on the radar for, 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 Labour, for Labour party members, but mm -hmm. also not for Labour voters, because people from the Red Wall don't really care about those sorts of things the way that people in the Tory party do. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's all but inevitable. But I just think, what a lost opportunity to think we had this mm -hmm. allegedly conservative government who mm -hmm. was supposed to be carrying the, the, the banner for Britain mm -hmm. and, and for our future. This, catac this cataclysmic list of failures that we've had, you know, a, a parliament that was against us, bureaucracy mm -hmm. against us, diplomatic world against us, and the media against us. And you, you had, you've had an, 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 a completely incompetent prime minister under Theresa May, so many lost opportunities. Then to have COVID on top of the whole thing, nothing has been more cursed yeah. than mm -hmm. the path to get liberty and freedom through Brexit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose added to that, there is, this, the, there is the, the, the idea that the Labour Party, it depends what, what, what the landslide's going to be like, I think, how big it's going to be. Uh, and the Labour Party really do have other fish to fry at the moment. And I think one of those is answering the question, what is a woman? Mm. Um, and I think, I just think that, you know, if you are a woman and, and, and you, you vote for the Labour Party, you are voting for disempowerment. And I think that that, that sense is growing. The reason I just make this point is because all of this identity stuff is very much positioned in Europe. A lot of it comes out of Europe, Europe and Canada and the US, but I think Europe is a key thing. So maybe, 
I think, John, I think, I think you're right. And I think you're right as well, Rafe. Maybe it will happen eventually, but maybe it's much, much further. Mm. Hang on, on a second, let's look at hasn't come so much into this yeah. school identity culture, and yet it's much more closely aligned. So I'm, I'm not thinking it's ah, it's the, the EU Swiss relationship is full of problems. Oh, yeah, uh, no, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and of they, and they, they, they never get what they want out of Switzerland. But let me just make two points, because I think I do disagree. Um, the first is that um, it, it it was not a conser Brexit was not a conservative project. The conservative government had spent 40 years trying to make the conservatives the party of Europe. They never succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but, they, but they kept the leaderships of the Tory party. It was a very uh, anti-Brexit, more than probably a lot of Labour people. And secondly, the Labour Party um, is split down the middle. And if you ha do have uh, the present leadership, and I think you, uh, you will carrying out the kind of policy you're talking this is going to cause disaffection mm -hmm. of a serious kind among the conservative voters in in, in, the, in working class but not just working class areas uh, the sorry the conservative blue collar yeah, yeah, yeah. vote mm -hmm. and and there you're going to have two parties and after an election the Labour Party is going to have rows with its uh, rank and file because it's doing things on Europe they don't like and the Conservative Party will probably be rejecting the leadership that has been making the concessions you're talking about and the choosing uh, other people and uh, if people like Kemi Badenoch and Suella Braverman or any guys or any indication the rank and file like they're much more mm. patriotic stance yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're talking about cross purposes I of course understand that the, yeah. the Brexit was never a conservative project in the long scheme of things mm. I'm saying post the, the implementation post yeah. the yeah. referendum yeah. it was the conservative yeah. government yeah. that it was, was uh, closely yeah. allied with it and they've got all the flack of it and the Labour Party I don't think would go down that same path but actually you know one of my great regrets was that the whole Brexit campaign hadn't been more balanced because I don't know if people remember um, what was the name of the chap who was from the RMT Cro um, oh, Bob Crow yes yeah. Bob Crow yeah, who died. wanted to set up a left-wing version yeah. of UKIP mm. in order to have the Lexit arguments put forward mm. but he had a heart attack just before the Brexit referendum yeah. came into mm. campaign mode same thing we lost Tony Benn at the mm. same time mm. now if we'd had Benn and Crow mm. as the standard bearers for the for the Lexit campaign mm. as well yeah. we would have had a much more balanced approach yeah. to this rather than it yeah. being tarred with the conservative or let me say right-wing brush but where I will disagree with you though is what everything you're saying is about formal entry into the EU. No, but no, I think no. informal entry would, would, would not would, would not would, would only really be applying to issues which wouldn't really resonate that much with the red wall and that's why I don't think that they would be the, the threat to the blue collar con uh, conservative small c conservative labor voters that you're suggesting. That doesn't your last argument doesn't apply I think to the case that we will gradually move into a closer relationship with Asia, with the Asian economies, probably, probably through the Trans-Pacific Part Trade Partnership, but not so. But I don't, see Labour, I don't see Labour buying that argument as my point as well. Ah, well, they won't buy the argument, but they'll find themselves in a situation in which they'll have to break established um, relationships, as they did in with the Commonwealth in the early 60s, and those were they were painful. But the, inter the interesting thing here is even when we were in the EU, Germany was able to increase its global share of trade far better than we were. Mm. Uh, so being a member of the EU isn't necessarily the impediment to that that I think you're mm. suggesting. It would eliminate the ability to enter into the other, other free trade blocks as well. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't expand your trade significantly. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting <laughs> that, that you will not actually be able to align with Europe if you're aligning with a completely different set of countries and have committed yourself legally to do so. Well, I think it's very good to see Hardy disagree. <laughs> we, very, we get far too little of it on this show. <laughs> No, no, I think it, uh, we have actually added, of course, to this kind of sort of uh, talk of leaving by actually having discussed it, I'm afraid. Uh, so we've sort of like egged it on a bit. But um, I think that's it for this weekend. Just want to thank uh, Adonis Sullivan, thank you, Rafe and Phil Philip here. Um, and we shall see you next time on Newsweek. In the meantime, you know, please do subscribe, won't you? Uh, we started the year very, very well with subscriptions, but we're not complacent. So please do subscribe to the channel, won't you? And indeed, uh, like it and like this program, do all of that stuff. Okay, we shall see you next time. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme?
at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.